go to the men who have taken refuge in the old watchtower. Deliver to them a message. Today, we're leaping between the divisions and bonds in the increasingly besieged human stronghold of the Southlands to the factionalism and familial intrigue on the regal island of Numenor. I'm Dominic Patton. And I'm Anthony D'Alessandro. And welcome back to Deadlines Inside the Ring, the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power after show. There is a great darkness in the Southlands. As captured elf watchman, Arondir is freed by Adar, the leader of the orcs, to go tell the humans they must ally with his legions or die. As doom looms, Arondir becomes close again with healer Bronwyn and her often wayward son, Theo, who holds a key precious to the marauding orcs. On Numenor, Queen Regent Miriel has decided not to align herself and her people with Galadriel in the battle against the orcs. Yet despite a near uprising over a possible alliance with the elf, a haunting dream and the falling leaves of the white tree weighs heavy on the queen regent and convinces her to rethink her order and Galadriel is brought back to the island. When Arendir tries to escape the orcs, why did all of his friends have to die? Well, we wanted to isolate him. I mean, they didn't have to, I suppose, but um, we thought that it would be, uh, we felt we needed to bring him to an emotional low and to isolate him and to have Arendir be the one person that has an audience with Adar so that only he could travel back to Tir Harad and deliver the message. You have been told many lies. Some run so deep. Even the rocks now believe them. Ismael, tell us how Arondir and Adar came face to face in this episode. Wow, that scene was, I mean, that, the whole sequence, go back a little bit to episode three and everything that he's gone through, all the loss that he's experienced by that point so quickly. Augustus Prue, that plays my best friend, and Simon Merrill's, his father figure, he lost both of them. He's been separated from his love. He had to cut a tree down that it is, spiritually one of the most difficult things for an elf to do, you know. And then you meet this being that we've already been hearing for episodes that is just the darkest of them all. And again, even though there's this rage, there's also a moment of recognition of like, oh, is this guy acting from love as well? but on a different path. So it's just so intense to see that scene for me informed a lot of the complexities, the complexities of Arondir mm -hmm. as well. And that was a very, very interesting scene to play. Very complex and very satisfying. First impressions count. You only can reveal a character for the first time once. And so what we wanted to do was, was play with people's preconceptions of what this character is gonna look like. You know, someone that, someone that can strike fear into orcs, you assume is gonna be this monster. And so we wanted to sort of very much sort of reveal him in pieces, but then ultimately subvert what you think he's gonna look like. So by the time he turns up, you've seen the gloves, you've seen the hair, the scarring, but then when the camera finally comes around to his face, you realize he's not a monster at all. He's actually an elf, or what he seems like an elf. And to us and Orendir, suddenly everything is turned upside down. Say what you wish to say. I have said it already, a hundred times over, in every way but words. So there's like an instant chemistry we see here between your two characters. Two characters who clearly cared very deeply for each other, but you know, one's an elf, one's a human. Give us a sense about how you created that and how that chemistry, how much of it was natural for the two of you when you first met and how much you worked on to get these characters where you needed them to be. We had an instant rapport. Um, we have so much in common in our personal lives. Um, the struggle to get here to this moment for both of us, we've been doing this a very, very long time. We connected on, on that and very deep levels that I think helped bring that chemistry to life. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a lot of shared values. Well, we have a hybrid of being artists with also uh, caring about visibility, mm -hmm. caring about bringing our own people, our homes forward, our family. So it's not just like, oh, I wanna be famous. Yeah. It's like, no, I, I represent something greater than this. And we both take that on very, very strongly. That sense of purpose and responsibility, mm -hmm. which is very much our characters. Yeah. You know? We need to talk about representation. 
You know, what we're seeing in the Rings of Power is we're seeing people of color, we're seeing people in this fantasy world that we haven't seen before. What does that mean for you guys? It's such a proud moment, yeah. I think. Yeah. And I, I couldn't be more honored to be sharing it with Ismail. I think, you know, even between us and our communities, there's stigma between this union happening, which I think helps us play these roles of this forbidden romance, because both in my culture and yours, there's stigma, right? And crossing into the other and having a, a sort of a biracial relationship. And those are the types of barriers that we're, we're trying to sort of overcome um, with this representation. It's not only about being minorities, but it's also about overcoming stigma within our own communities. When you put us together, as Nazanin said, in our cultures themselves, you know, there's colorism, there's gender inequality, there's, mm -hmm. th 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 there's our own geopolitical things that we go through. Uh, but then there's a reality of the fantasy world. You know, if you want to bring it like uh, just more nuclear, there have historically not been uh, a variety of characters of color, if any at all, in this franchise per se. You know, I loved the movies. You know, I wanted to be an elf when I was a little kid. <laughs> and But then, you know, I felt spiritually represented, ideologically represented, because I grew up in the mountains of Puerto Rico, this little uh, poor town over there. But then, you know, the feedback came back very quick. No, you can't be an elf. You know, there's no elves that look like you. And so that that took me into this fantasy world and the representation of it. And the fact that indeed there was nobody, people were spitting facts. There was nobody that looked like me. There was no elves that looked like me. So I always wanted to be an elf. And uh, uh, this journey has come with, with a lot of love, mm -hmm. a lot of um, people feeling extremely proud of us for being here, but also our share of opposition, you know? And and quite quite determined that we don't belong. Promoters, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that we don't belong. And so it's been um, I I I think it's been galvanizing for me. Yeah, you know. Yeah, how do you I, feel about I it? I feel uh, just even more, more proud than I ever have of this cast. I cannot imagine anyone else in any of these roles. And Ismail, Cynthia, Sophia, Sara's, you know, Tyros, Tyro. Megan's, they all belong because they were the best person for the role. And that's yeah. that's that the crux of it. That's all it's about. I, I like to think that I'm the best person. I love and care so much for Aaron. They're this yeah. warrior led by love, you know, a deep curiosity for the other that gets them in trouble. <laughs> This, this, this deep you curiosity, you you're my trouble, <laughs> you know, this is my trouble. I'm like going crawling through tunnels and Rats. getting digs by orcs and being in trenches. I tell you, we remain here at our peril. We must spread the word. No! Arondir and Bronwyn were the first to sound the alarms about the dark forces, but nobody believed them until... That iconic uh, moment. Gosh, I love that moment so much. It was so fun to do. It mirrors sort of cultural divides, socioeconomic divides, right? I mean, I know Tolkien was not, not a fan of allegory, but you can't help think of the fact that I'm a poor man's human and you're kind of a poor man, poor oh. elf's elf. And we are the outcasts within our own community. So sort of having to prove that what we have to say matters and, and hey, listen, what I'm telling you is significant. Mm -hmm. Please listen to me. It kind of mirrors exactly what we were just discussing, this idea of having to prove yourself and having to go the extra mile to be heard and uh, included and, and not excluded. And I think that, again, helped our characters bond yeah. um, in the same way that we bonded off screen. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the family bond between your two characters and Theo, your son. And the relationship there is, you know, you jump in to rescue Theo when he goes to the village to search for food. Give us a sense of that because we're seeing what we nowadays would call a nuclear family developing right here in Middle Earth. It's a very important scene, I feel, for, for the three of us. Yeah, I think so too. I think there's a, um, over the course of the season, there's acceptance that happens of this relationship by Theo. There's still sort of like a guarded nature mm. to him with Arondir, but I do think there's sort of like um, a coming together of the three of us and an understanding of what this union means, not only in the romantic bond that we have, but, but in the greater scheme of things and how important it is to the greater dynamic of saving the Southlanders. And the fact that he's proven himself at this point to have been a staunch ally 
uh, if you will, and protecting us. It's funny, at the beginning, there was an element of like occupier versus the occupied. Mm. You start to see that Arondir isn't just occupying or trying to sort of control these people. I really there's, love these people. Yeah, there's a real deep bond. Part of Theo's arc is learning, you know, how important his relationship with his mother is and um, sort of also accepting Arondir as well. Yeah. Obviously, because, you know, there's been a hole there. And when someone new comes in, you know, you're always going to yeah. you know, be a little bit wary. And I think part of Theo's arc is learning to let his guard down with people that he can trust. In terms of Theo, he's still apprehensive. He has, he has no choice but to trust me. You know, I'm like, just run swiftly, lad. Yeah. They're coming. Yeah. That rescue, that first arrow is not soft. I smack him in behind the, the back with my bow to drop him. So I said, there's no softness there. It's also like, this is what we need to do. Like, smack him, turn around, grab that arrow. We will be wise to resolve this matter swiftly. She is but one elf. An avalanche can start with one stone. We dare not invite your father's cloud back overhead. So let's start with your character's relationships as cousins and as statesmen. I think you've got a very uphill task, actually, being Queen Regent, with your father still ill, Tar Palantir. It really is a case of people going, well, that's not what your dad would have done. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it really is like sort of pushing that mower uphill. And it kind of, in a way, makes my job... Uh, it's, it's a tough job, but... It, I don't know. It's it's one that I relish because it gives me a little bit of a little bit of power, a little bit of you know more self worth. I guess I th that's terrible. It makes me sound like I'm self worth. <laughs> Let's start again, actually. <laughs> Well, I think you bring up a good point in terms of what it is to lead in the shadow of when your father is king and you are queen, regent, soon to be presumptive leader, and you are observing the mistakes or the response to your predecessor's decisions, and so that you know that you want to avoid that same fate. I think with Mediel, I think for her, it's really about maintaining equilibrium and stability and the one thing that I always thought was really interesting to me about, you know, this role of Midiel and, and sort of her dynamic with Farazan is there aren't many people that she can really confide in. And in fact, she doesn't even confide in him about the state of the king. You know, this is sort of the secret she sort of carries on her own. But in terms of thinking out loud and trying to strategize around, you know, going this way or that, you know, as cousins and as people who are sort of uh, nobles, they can speak to one another, they can confide in one another. She can't really turn to anybody else. Your people will be relieved. They'll be gathering soon in the court and in the plaza to hear your announcement. Then we ought not to keep them. In the future lore, Muriel is supposed to be the sort of fourth ruling queen of Numenor, and um, she is usurped by, by, by Farazan. So it was important to us to establish a really close relationship between the two of them. You know, her as queen regent and him, Farazan as her advisor. And to really establish that he's in her ear, which seems sort of innocent enough this season, but can later sort of be used against her, you know, in, in future seasons. My friends, trust in me. Farazan is definitely on the side of the king's men. There's no doubt about that. And I think there's, you see a, a very, the, a, you start to see the, the, the rudiments of a very innovative guy. You know, he's always been innovative. He's always, you know, been forward thinking. But now we get to see this man in motion. And where a clear sense of identity for the self as a Numenorean. We don't want to be second class citizens anymore. I think a lot of people can see themselves when faced, you know, stood next to an elf. You know, why don't we get to live forever? There is a, a sense of anomie that can creep in, like a sense of burning injustice. We want to dispense with that way. And we want to take it in a very forward thinking um, manner that celebrates who we are. I swear that elven hands will never take Numenor's helm. 
there's a reason why we, you know, we hew from the rock and we cut down trees and, you know, to build ships and to build these statues. They're moral markers for the next generation of Numenorians because we're not going to live forever. We don't get to learn from our mistakes thousands of years in the future. We need to set down markers for the next generation. Talk about the burden of the prophecy that she carries and her reaction to seeing the white petals and how that changes her mind on helping Galadriel. Well, I guess there is that sense of the foreboding, whether she's looking for a sign purposely or whether there is, again, this sense of something is wrong, something is off. Midiel's concern really is she wants to make the best decision to really guide her people. You know, this is about leading her people in the right direction. And the, and the, of course, the question is, what is the right direction? It's not necessarily clear. I think it's actually quite beautiful and cinematic how it's presented, these visions, and of course, everything symbolic with the petals. Because I think, I think we actually had a change. I think there was a version where there were some stones, some sta I don't know if you remember this, but I think there was a version of the script where there were some stacked stones and the stones fell. And I remember it. There was, there was a we different- we are <laughs> many, many moons ago. Each of us, every one, must decide who we shall be. I think for me, even when I sort of got to the point of giving uh, the speech, I thought a lot about what it is to be somebody who, from a very young age, is being reared for leadership. You know that this is your path. and. You know, I always thought about her sense of reluctance, her sense of, again, like she wants to do what is best. She, you know, in terms of her guidance to, to make those decisions, she has the king, she has Farazan, but it is still ultimately going to be her her decisions, her, her choices that, um, you know, affect the masses, affect Numenorean society. And it's funny, I remember that day giving the speech, you know, when you're doing speeches like that and they've got to film it many, many takes, many, many times, the first time you give the speech is the most impactful. Everybody's really sort of listening to you. Then the challenge is to try and give that speech 20 more times and still hold people's attention and, and sort of find variations in the speech. But I, I wanted to use that speech as a transition from that reluctant leader to somebody who is the committed leader. I'm, I'm making this choice. This, this is the choice that I'm going with and, and I stand firm in this. I own this decision. Favorite scene, I mean, it's like choosing which is your favorite child, but I'll have to go with uh, Princess Deesa pleading to the rocks. There's so much music and song in Tolkien's work and it was great to be able to explore a little bit more of the kind of incredibly secretive society of the dwarves and get to kind of imagine what their music must be like. One of the things that Tolkien was incredibly passionate about, and it runs right through the books, but you can't hear it from the page, is song. This is a world that was literally created by song. So for us to bring that into the show is so powerful and so moving. I was talking to Bear McCreary last night and just gushing because for an auditory and musical person like me, the world, this incredible visual world really comes to life when we hear it. So, so the music that runs through the show that, that scores um, a scene is then um, punctuated by these moments where the characters actually break into song. And with Sophia, who has a stunning voice, stunning, to hear it become not just something that was technically beautiful, but actually active, actually changing the world around the character was incredibly powerful and moving and a joy to work on with her. How many Tolkien languages and dialects do you speak? And how many of them are actually used in the Rings of Power? It's funny when people ask how many of Tolkien's languages I speak, because the more you know about Tolkien, the more you know that none of them are actually complete. So there's so much Elvish, for example, that's the one that he focused on the most. And there are two different main types of Elvish, there's uh, Quenya and there's Sindarin. And I've got quite a bit of experience with those two. But then you move on to something like Kuzdul, which is Dwarvish, 
which Tolkien described as a secret language. And I think that's mainly because he just wanted to focus on Elvish. That's my, that's my suspicion. But I speak a bit of that. Uh, I speak some Orkish, which which sometimes I use if, you know, if there's a, a dog that is, you know, um, interested in my dog and getting a bit, you know, a bit um, agitated. You know, I just bark out a bit of Orkish and that calms them right down. You know, something like that where you just, it grabs people's attention. Who among the cast was really good at talking Elvish and Orkish and Dwarvish and who couldn't remember their lines? Oh gosh, it's, now you're asking me to play favorites. I'm, I'm so proud of the way that the actors embraced this work. I'm, it's what you hope for. You hope that people will kind of want to join you in the nerdy world of what Professor Tolkien loved more than anything else. So, so when they just jump at that chance and actually um, want to know more than is, is that they have in the text, um, in the script, and they want to know how to describe these things around them. They want to feel like they can connect to the world in the way that their character would. That's a joy. So any actor who does that is, is my idea of a good time. And it's really, the, our cast is full of those people. And I think somebody like Ismael, for example, who plays Arondir, he came to this world not necessarily knowing where his place was in it. It's, it's not a world that really may have felt like it was available to everybody. But when you have someone whose first language is Spanish meet the vowels and the consonants of the Elvish language and just fly, you think this is this is for everyone. Everyone's welcome. Come on in. It was wonderful. That's it for today's Deadlines Inside the Ring. Thanks for joining us. And join us again next week for more of the Inside Scoop on Prime Videos, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. Whoa, oh my god! I see the See you later. We have to try everything. Drink Hello. I don't care about the show. I just want a good blooper reel. I want to learn science. science. <laughs> you guys are going to make me look like I'm in the show, right? You're going to put in the effects. Replace the green. I don't want to look like an asshole here. Sorry. <laughs>